Okay, back live here, wrapping up day two, EMC World. We're here with Sam Curry, CTO of RSA. Hey, Sam. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. And and our man, Mike Versace, otherwise known as Mickey Versace. <laughs> nice. Hey, thanks, know. Dave. And, uh, <laughs> Hadn't heard that one. That's We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, he even starts calling himself Mickey Versace because we call him that so much. But, uh, That's right. You know, he fits into the, to the Volante, the Volante, Versace. Right. We had a Tucci on yesterday. That works. So. That works. Yeah, it works well. So I'm breaking that. So, yeah, yeah, curry kind of doesn't fit. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we're here at EMC World, Private Cloud, uh, The Cube. You know, we're going, going live two days straight. It's unbelievable. And... Um, you know, behind us have been these keynotes, a lot, a lot on the private cloud. A little different this year than last year. Last year was like, well, yeah, I really know what this is, and and now it's like, okay, we got to really make this happen. Starting to come together, and one of the evil twins of the private cloud and the cloud is security. The other one, of course, being management. But uh, so. You're like the most important person, you know, on the planet right so now. Because I'm an evil twin, is that one of the evil twins, right. right? We have to like straighten you out and you know, make it all good, right? The Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing. So, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so anyway, maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know what what you're seeing with the state of security and cloud. Is is you know we had a, earlier uh, somebody was saying that they felt uh, it was Tim from RSA said you right. know what in, in in many respects and Mike you've talked about this. Cloud is an opportunity to be more inherently more secure. Okay, yeah. those are some of the sort of paradigms we're looking at. And uh, so, what do you see as the state of security in, as in the context of the cloud? Well, that's a it's a good question. I think Tim put it very well. Um, the, the the private cloud certainly the, the very private in there is critical. I think uh, when people say security, they often mean uh, at least four or five different things. Right? We could talk about health. We could talk about the one U rack mountable firewall that you buy and slot in. You could talk about antivirus. You could talk about identities. The big guy the big, is behind all you. of it, right? <laughs> the big bouncer at the, the door, bouncer, right? right. Uh, <laughs> the guns and the guards and the gates and the G's, right? Um, but uh, when you get down to it, it's about the confidentiality of the data and of the processes, of the the integrity of it and the availability of it. So the the CIA's, right? Uh, and when you get down to it, uh, a, another label you could you could put on those things is privacy. And so um, I like the use of the word private with private cloud. You could think of it as a chance for a do-over, right? This mm -hmm. is, uh, yeah. if you think of the heterogeneity and the complexity of the typical legacy computing environment, that is, um, look, security events happen on seams. Things fall apart on seams. You lose confidentiality. You lose the ability to say that just you and I are doing something or validating that things haven't been changed. Uh, or making sure that things are available. Those are the principles of security, and, and Tim had it right on, right? This is the chance to actually have a do-over for security. Um, in moving to a private cloud, you can make the cloud private and therefore secure. Um, it changes the, pro the paradigm for how we do security from the legacy environment. And I actually like the language, you mentioned the other evil twin, management. Um, the base language here is risk, so if you, Think about it, the language that you can use between the security professional and the business is one of risk, and, it, and, and risk is a language that everybody seems to understand at the table. So um, we can stop calling them evil twins and call them perhaps uh, misplaced siblings. Or so I think the lingua franca is much, much better. That's it. It's a lingua franca, siblings, Rosetta yeah. Stone, those yeah. all work, right? <laughs> so an ability to have a conversation about business principles. I, I spoke with uh, one bank, and they said, you know, we're a bank. That means we're a target. If we don't want to be a target, we shouldn't be a bank. Yeah. There's a, this thing called yeah. acceptable risk for acceptable return, right? And uh, there is a level of risk that is acceptable. The only thing that's inexcusable is not being able to analyze, understand it, and sign off on it. Um, you know, I, I, in talking about DLP technologies, one, one technology that gives you an ability to control data and create a data stack, if you will, whether it's legacy or cloud. Um, you know, the, in, in just discussing something like DLP, um, I had one customer who was saying, so, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, what, what if my CEO's bad? Uh, what if he's gone rogue or my CFO? And I said, well, look, I, I hate to say this, but you're going to have to trust someone. Mm -hmm. um, as a security professional, your job isn't to eliminate risk. It's to make it quantifiable and measurable and acceptable for acceptable return. And if you have a rogue CEO, there's ways to deal with that. There's ways to spot it. But at some point, you have to trust someone. And that, that's how it goes. Yeah, and so, I think the, so the, 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 the point on trust is really important. I think the theme of this uh, the conference today is the journey, right? So yeah. the journey to the private cloud starts now. Yeah. So from a security perspective, what are you advising clients in terms of where to start? Where's the starting point and how do they know they're there? The, I think that that's a, it's a great question, but the, the, the actual starting point happens before a journey to the cloud. 
um, or journey anywhere. It's sort of like you know, they, they say when you're a hiker that you should watch the ounces and the pounds will follow, right? You want to make sure you're carrying the right weights and have the right things. Before you engage in any journey, make sure you've packed the right things. Make sure you've thought about when you're going to need food and shelter. Um, which, and the basics for this is having a data classification model. Um, if you can't solve these problems, or at least have a way of approaching the problems in a legacy environment, then you have an opportunity when you're thinking about the journey to the cloud to sit down and do your homework mm -hmm. and start talking about uh, data classification, start talking about risk. Um, are you able to couch the movement to the cloud in risk terms? And if so, can you actually make it a, a, a lower risk footprint or a risk mm -hmm. landscape? Then you're starting to actually have a security and a cloud discussion at the same time. So do you, do you think in general the security professional is engaged enough at this point in that discussion or is is this sort of risk topic or risk question, is it one of those balls that sort of gets bounced around the organization looking for a place to land? Y yes and no. Um, there are some who are doing it well, as there are with most things, and there are some who aren't. Mm. And it depends uh, in large part on the vertical that's in, that you're talking about, the size of the company and where. So some organizations have been through this journey before. They've learned the stumbling blocks in going to an internal private cloud, to an external private cloud, to doing a VDI initiative. Um, to doing those things and the good news is it doesn't matter what industry you're in uh, you can actually learn best practices from other industries and other locations but it requires a community so my, my biggest advice is if you're about to, to think about um, how to get maybe a business justification for the cloud even in some cases out of security mm -hmm. or you're looking at a journey to the cloud carve out the time to do the security conversation ahead of time because it may in fact enable better buy-in from your management, the other evil twin, right? It may, <laughs> right, in, fact, it may in fact other, it, it may in fact give you the business justification to do it and better tools and a better end result uh, when you find that you've got a lower risk profile. I, I, my favorite example um, that uh, popped up today, uh, I, I don't know where it came from, but um, we're, you know, in many ways the security person in a journey to the cloud is going to become like the Maytag repair guy, right, waiting for the call. Um, it's time to mature the security function as well. A lot of folks are sitting there going, my company's doing this and they're not hearing the security risks. Well, couch it as a risk discussion and you now have a job as a risk manager going forward. Everybody in a company in a little yin yang, you're either 90% risk and 10% reward or the flip side, 90% reward and 10% risk, <laughs> right? right? So um, make yourself one of those two profiles and the security job can evolve into being a risk advisor to the business or you'll find yourself irrelevant down the road. That's really interesting you're talking about the Maytag repairman. We've been talking all week about how storage is sexy. You know, we got Joe Tucci to say, well, I don't know if it's sexy, but. It's hot. It's hot, <laughs> yeah. definitely hot. Now, security and, is sexy, and, by the way. And, so and you security, that, right? well, what you're saying, <laughs> security is sexy, but we want to make it boring. Right. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. So, you know, boring means low risk. Yeah, right. uh, part of our job is to make this, well, boring. Uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons that security gets so much attention from the press is it's cloak and dagger, mm. it's spyware, it's thieves, it's criminals. You have visions of somebody in an alley going, Psst, hey, you want to buy one of these? Right? That's, <laughs> that, that's kind of got a glitz to it, right? Uh, um, that's got to go away. That's got to be a thing of the past, just as we've done away in, in, with, with other uh, plagues and ail ailments of society. We right. can do away with cybercrime as well if we make it boring. Right, that's what we should be doing. So what's so? I mean, so what is RSA doing about that? It's, so it's a lot of education, it seems right now. Yeah. Education and awareness, and getting involved in the organization. What do you see RSA's role in doing that, and how are you actually executing? That? So one of one of my um, one of my pet peeves is is FUD, right? Fear, right. uncertainty, and doubt. I always gets people started. Uh, yeah. well, what are you doing in this business then? Uh, well, uh, well, exactly, <laughs> right. right. So a lot of the industry has been pulled that way. Mm -hmm. I walked into a utility, and um, and I was talking to. Um, uh, talking to uh, to them and, and said, so how's your smart grid deployment going, right? You've heard about smart meters and stuff. And sure. they said, great, we're rolling a 1,000 out a day. And I said, so what are you doing for encryption? And they said, nothing. And I had this little gasp. I went, oh my goodness, they're doing nothing, right? And the guy said, here comes the FUD. They've been bred to think that security vendors who walk into the room are going to scare them. I saw one presentation who I, somebody I won't mention, they'll know who they are. Uh, they presented to a large IT crowd and they actually put p pictures of collisions of trains up on the screen and, <laughs> and ruptured pipelines. And the idea was don't worry, in our hands you're safe. That, we should be building security into the fabric. So to answer your question about what we're doing, I'm trying to actually walk in and go, you see that train? 
Like right. you need to risk. You need to understand the risk and the likelihood of that actually happening or not happening. You need to be able to manage this as a process. You need to make the tools more transparent. Build it into the infrastructure. You need to be getting away from content races and, and proprietary agents. Get to adaptive, self-learning systems. Um, that stuff is all very doable. So to answer your question, we're doing a lot around that. Um, you know, inv everything from investigating how the bad guys really behave to helping people understand is it likely to happen to them and how to actually make security more boring. How do you make it more transparent so that it's built in rather than something you got to go and bolt on with a screwdriver after? So, and, and RSA has always, always had this tremendous security research and development agenda, right? Tremendous yeah. research and development, and has done a, a tremendous amount in that space. Relative to private cloud, um, last year you talked a lot about Ionix integration yeah. with Envision, DLP, strong authentication. How's that sort of product strategy moving forward relative to the overall research that RSA does in security matters. Yes, yeah, so th three things come to mind. The, the first is that we um, we have a number of products that we feel are essential. If ultimately what we want to do is connect people with data, mm -hmm. then we need to make sure we're doing business with people. You actually have the right controls to to affect the data, right? You want to build a data stack. It's not about whether you can affect a particular piece of technology or even a business app. You, regulations don't come out that say well, what are your policies for Solaris, Linux, or Windows? They come out and say, can you say you're doing the right things with someone's data, right? Or with your own data in the case of trade secrets. So a set of tools around that, DLP is a good example. DLP right. beyond being a, a, you know, an app or product that you buy actually gives you the ability to have controls around data, so data centrism. Um, then making sure the, per the people are the right people and then after the fact that you can find out what's really happened, you know, reconstructing things and then enrichment of that information. So every one of our products is going through a how do you interoperate and work with the cloud? Mm -hmm. um, how can you, we actually offer them up, and in many cases we already do, as software mm -hmm. as a service? And then we're starting to cut into new areas in security. So it's not about just taking antivirus or firewalls or even authentication and just slapping it in, mm -hmm. right? What we've got to do is say, how do you get a hardware root of trust? How do you make sure something called the blue pill attack can't be done, where there's an a priori computing environment that's encapsulating you? How do we make sure that there isn't any VM poisoning going on or that you can actually have a policy that says data in the cloud can only run on a chipset in a country or that's been hardened or in a VM that has been hardened. And we've started to bring some of those solutions to market as well, mostly through proof of concepts at this point, but by working with VMware, right. uh, with Intel, Intel and the like as well. Yeah, yeah. Else, it's very interesting. So I know what Joe talked a lot about, the difference between um, you know, what we've been doing for 30 years, which is bolting on security, right? Yeah. And now designing it in or building it in. So there must be a balance there that you're trying to strike between on the on the research and development side, as well as with, within product investment. Can you talk oh, yeah. a little bit about that? So, I mean, there's no shame in bolting something on when you first run into a problem. Right. Um, in my hometown, there's a bridge that says temporary bridge on it. It's 50 <laughs> years old. <laughs> right. right? I'm, there comes a point where you go, well, why is it still there? And is it safe, right? Because it rattles quite a bit. Um, so uh, I think there's no shame in bolting something on the first time, but over time there is shame in not making it part of the infrastructure and not yeah. in fact allowing it to follow a graceful and natural commoditization curve. And that is in fact what happens with a lot of security. It draws more and more attention unto itself. Mm -hmm. um, so the challenge I think is to continuously get out of a few things most of security winds up a content race. And the reason is quite simple. There's an intelligent opponent trying to break in. So if you come up with an architectural breakthrough, they'll hammer away until they find a way over, under, or through, right? right? And then you have to do an update, and then the excel it accelerates. Most architectural breakthroughs actually only have a shelf life associated with the technology or a time period. So it's up to us to keep continuously innovating so that the bad guys eventually can't afford the investment to get over, under, or through, because they're in it for financial reasons right now. So yeah. part of the, the, the challenge is um, improve the content race cycles, innovate and get out of that, and as much as possible, differentiate on the basis of intelligence, adaptation. Yeah. Security is effective. You know, if I think about it, we will never eliminate theft from our lives, or at least we haven't in the few thousand years we've, we've had civilization so far. I don't expect we're going to eliminate it online anytime soon, but we could make it a lot less profitable for them and a lot less likely. So you, you, That's you, uh, worthy. You want to lower the ROI for, That's right. for the bad guys. Uh, you know, yeah. they, they say you, you, come, you come to be like your opponent over time, right? And they come to be like right. you. Um, in fact, they are starting to sit around boardroom tables and think in terms of ROI. Probably one of the biggest clouds out there is what we've coined the dark cloud. 
um, the things like the Configure uh, right. bot or uh, Cinewall or Zeus have massive cloud infrastructures behind them, and they're not worried about the niceties of, <laughs> of liability, right? They, they work with criminals in many instances. So um, they're out there for ROI. And meanwhile, by the way, the computing technologies cross the barrier. We use similar techniques in terms of actual coding um, to build modules that they use. Cloud's a good example. We're building a cloud, they're building a cloud. We're learning, <laughs> we're learning technology as we go forward. Therefore, it is always going to be a content race. It's up to the industry, though, to bake in what we can do, right. make it more reflexive, right. and move on to smarter architectural breakthroughs. And that's the race we should be in. That's right. So, it's a, so the maturity curve is a little bit about bolt on now what you have, right? Yeah, no shame in that. Construct the solution, you know, in the middle middle piece where you have tighter integration, and VMware is a big part of that, of course. Mm -hmm. And then it's the real design stuff. Right? It's the it's design the real, stuff. It's the fundamental make design that, integration. Make that bolted stuff go in, and, and by the way, the faster you can put it in the infrastructure, as we try mm -hmm. to do, the better. But then keep moving forward optimally to make it not efficient for them to keep attacking, right? Because it is a financial equation. There's a whole other way of looking at it around things like espionage and, and the, 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 the more cloak and dagger, literally cloak and dagger side of things. But on the financial side, you can you can make the risk much, much lower, and that's where the most of the risk is coming from. What, what do you think, what would you say are some of the gr biggest breakthroughs relative to security and everything that private cloud has to offer? I mean, I, I look at the uh, the development around the Westmere chip as being really fundamental. That's oh, yeah. fundamental security design into the architecture. What do you think about that and any other examples you yeah, have so, that are really so fundamental? So the Westmere chip's a really good example, right? They, they've embedded a number of algorithms there so you can call on the chip to effectively do things like crypto functions. Right. Um, but most importantly, you can actually get a trusted boot sequence so that you can make sure there's nothing there beforehand. Right, you can make sure that your VM isn't running in someone else's container that's sitting on that chip. You can also query and say, what else is running in this memory space? That's very powerful. But those are things that are being built into the infrastructure, right? Uh, VMware is also uh, building new features into things like v vCenter and, and, and vCloud eventually, right? But new features that let you leverage that and build a chain of trust that cuts down through various layers. You could almost think of it as hardware authentication and let you, especially, especially through zones, build zones that let you have similar physical characteristics that you can say, my data can only exist in XYZ, right? And those could be location, a list of pre-authorized chips, what have you. Um, that's very powerful as well. And Absolutely. we're on the other side are layering in those functions I talked about earlier and making them progressively more transparent. How do you make sure the right people, um, how do you actually identify the data throughout that stack, regardless of physical location? Um, how do you do the crypto and, and what have you? Right? right, very good. So in this in this <coughs> uh, effort to do over, let's call it, um, the way you get from A to B, knowing that the IT business, I mean, you can't throw anything away, right? So you're saying it's the true. way to do that is to just get tighter and tighter integration, deeper integration. And, and, and part of the challenge, by the way, um, is going to be, it's very hard to leave behind the old. And I can look to history and say, well, I can, I can see roughly what people will do going from one wave of technology to another. It'll stick around, yeah. right? There will be some legacy stuff. Um, you need to identify uh, if, uh, if, if, you're, um, if, if you're going from a high-risk environment and moving to the cloud to lower your risk. Um, there are instances in SMBs where almost everybody by going to the cloud can get there. That's a great example. Right? Um, right. You know, because they often don't have an IT department and a security department, and frankly, just having some standards might improve that, even without laying in some features. Um, at the larger enterprises, sometimes a very granular understanding of risk associated with their data and their infrastructure. So uh, how, how, is the, how is the provider of cloud services going to demonstrate to you what they're doing, that you can show compliance, you can actually manage the risk? The more that becomes transparent, the more you're focusing on the task and less the tool, the better you're going to be at managing risk. Right. So um, I, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but there's an awful lot we could, we could talk about there. Well, I just like, well, minutes, go ahead. yeah, sure, on that point about um, sort of auditing and sort of understanding yeah. what the provider is actually doing relative to security. There's been some big developments going on, sort of skunk work activities around cloud audit and building namespaces for the purpose of publishing audit data from cloud service providers. Mm -hmm. Some perspective on that? Have you been involved in that? I, watching I, it? It's I sort have, of, and there's a few it's different... coming up from the ground right now. And I'm there's just, a few different ways um, to look at it. The, right. I'm going to say that first of all, uh, I, I sat, well actually I was addressing a room once and said we need to share data. I've published a game theory derived model to predict how bad guys will behave, right? Uh, when you can quantify gains and losses. And I said, we need to share data. 
And somebody in the back of the room quipped, uh, capitalists aren't altruists. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought about it for a second. I said, you know, that's not always true. Uh, a good example is bees, right? Some, some breeds of bees will sting and kill, and they die when they do so. And you have to ask yourself, why would anything evolve to be that way? Why would anything in nature evolve to be able to actually do something altruistic for the hive, like sting an opponent, and die? And the answer has to be it's getting more out of the hive mm -hmm. than it's even its own life is worth for the propagation of its DNA. So not all altruism is, in fact, altruistic. There's some selfish motivation. Um, and and it, frankly, when you get to the point where being part of a community, you get back... Uh, get back more than you invest, and in particular, when you start to get orders of magnitude more back than you invest, then it, it makes then the only choice for you is to be part of a community. Right. And I think um, a lot of the talk around uh, around this is to try to generate metadata, metadata because it's not reversible, it's like hashes, right? A hash, a hash function takes right. something, and the output can be compared to see if the in two inputs were the same, but you can't reverse it. You can't get the pig back from the sausages, right? <laughs> um, and um, and and so you want it to be metadata, but then you want to be able to start looking for patterns and generating new forms of information. As soon as we can do that, we can protect your privacy and subscribing to a community and sharing your data right. in exchange for getting out more stuff that helps you immunize and protect and reduce risk. So the, you know, it's up to us, I think. We are a bigger community than the bad guys. They are better at, co at communicating and sharing. There is honor among thieves. It's up to us to use things like this to actually try to change the equation, right? We mm -hmm. want to try to share our logs. We want to share the information about where the bad guys are. Don't let them hide behind one another and, and behind our, our own inability to coordinate. We may be slower, but there's more of us. And so mm -hmm. I think ultimately if we can actually figure out how to share data, metadata, in a way that doesn't violate privacy, we're going to be much more effective as, at reducing risk across the globe. And the data can be consumed by a, a bunch of different applications, and I think those applications oh, yeah. um, uh, could, could be other service provider applications, they could be audit applications, they can be service and security applications also. So you're actually making, you know, sort of the, the, the security task more real time, yeah. which is, I think, a real value that comes out of some of the work. Yeah, if you think, in, if instead of, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, um, Security is, by and large, um, reducing the risk associated with all of our processes and our data. Mm -hmm. But there's other forms of risk than just security risks. And so consuming that information can, can benefit availability. It can benefit troubleshooting. Your NOC might benefit from it when it's doing root cause analysis, for instance. So there's an awful lot to be said for creating these meta communities, right? If we can do that effectively, there's a ton of benefits we can get out of that. Excellent. And right. they're not marketing benefits, by the way. So, uh, I know a lot of folks worry about that. That's the whole reason it has to be metadata and not data. Right. Good. One other, one other quick ahead, point. Yeah. Um, I think I, the um, the RSA Share project, which is yeah. something newly announced here, a new community around yeah. engineering uh, applications, more secure applications. Comments about that? Yeah. So the if you look at um, the history among a lot of security providers, among a lot of IT and software, is that the way something is done is very yeah, often absolutely. the secret sauce. Um, and uh, we're working on the on the belief that there is more to be gained in the community uh, by making some of that secret sauce, in fact, open, right, or free, and giving it away and embedding it. As much as we use a common set of tools, um, RSA, we actually can go off and focus on things like intelligence management, uh, understanding the dark cloud, mm. um, but we can actually do more to do a sort of shields up, if you will, uh, for the Internet, right? Here's a set of tools that are hardened and trusted and true and rather than you using something you cobble together yourself which would which is pointless for a technology that's existed for a long time we have versions of some of these software that we can share that will in fact raise general security levels far more um, than almost anything else we could do so RSA share actually began with be safe right that's there's right. some versions of be safe we're giving away for free um, there's information about it on our website and there's other technology toolkits we've put in there and uh, that we're going to follow it with but the principle is Let's get as many people using world-class security products as possible. And Excellent. RSA Share. So I just had one question, one final question for you, Sam. And we've been asking this of a lot of the executives who've come on. We've got some folks in the audience, some young people. They might be in college, some kids who maybe have graduated. A lot of technology people, you know, out there watching. I wonder us. if I scared anybody away from security with the Maytag comment. Well, you know, <laughs> but maybe there's some people like you that really like to take on some tough challenges, you know. So what we have asking you to do is maybe just give some advice to some of the younger people out there that might be interested in getting into the technology business. What in technology in general, or any particular parts? Uh, well, cloud's really cool. I mean, well, I mean, you're a CTO of a of a large company. You know, it's a you know a very successful individual. You've got great perspectives. Um, 
you know, somebody interested in getting into the to the technology field, how about even specifically the security business? You know, what so, would you um, recommend? Be bold, be an adventurer. Adventurism is a good thing. Um, you know, some of the greatest uh, some of the greatest uh, breakthroughs we've had as a culture came from a far smaller population base. Um, many of our many of us have, uh, if you think about. Uh, uh, pioneering and uh, going out and pushing boundaries. It usually happens with somebody with a pretty stupid idea. Uh, <laughs> and um, your ideas are probably not that stupid. Um, it, it don't assume somebody else has done it. If something you, really and truly you find fascinating um, absorbs you, then pursue it and tell your friends about it. And if they think you're stupid, uh, tell me about it. I mean, you can always send me an email, right? That, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty straightforward. Um, but uh, keep pushing. And 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 uh, gravitate to the things that you find interesting and fascinating. Uh, my background is nothing to do, with, by the way, with computer science. It was originally physics and and, and literature. Um, but uh, we rarely, by the way, map out what we're going to do in life and then follow that path. That would be rather boring, in fact. <laughs> so follow the thing you find truly passionate now. And by the way, later on, you will look back and find a logical sequence. So we all do that, sit down and go, well, here's my background. How logical did it, logically did it flow? Um, Tiger Woods did that, follow the sequence thing. Yeah. Look what happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> right, good, good, good point. Um, but, um, uh, and then by all means, uh, you know, uh, do look at him as, a, as an example of, of uh, but what you really <laughs> yeah, want. That wasn't boring. <laughs> yeah, no, that wasn't boring at all. You don't want that kind of not no. boring in your life. But what you should do is um, uh, follow your passion. Uh, don't say no. Don't accept pat answers. Um, uh, I, I can think of many brilliant teachers that I've had. The best mm -hmm. ones, though, were the ones who actually stopped and listened to something that sounded like it should have an obvious answer and didn't. So um, just push the envelope and, and don't settle don't settle for someone saying, well, that's how we do it. And the best advice I ever got, by the way, there was a woman named uh, Janet Chandler uh, many years ago. She sat next to me and said, uh, I said, so how did you get where you are? And she said, I never said no to anything. And um, I can honestly say I don't think I've ever said no to anything in my career. And that may sound awful because you'll hear a lot of people say, push back. That's not your job. It's somebody else's job. Leave it to them. Just never say no. Mm -hmm. um, nothing should pass your desk without getting your imprint. Um, nothing is too small, and nothing is the sort of thing that uh, you should just ignore, right? If something goes by, own it. Sam, it's great. Uh, you know, Mike and I have been up to Bedford a few times. We really enjoy your perspectives. I think you're brilliant. Oh, uh, you're, thank you. It's unbelievable to me the way you're able to, and then your literature background just sort of explain some of it, able to, to, to share some of these very interesting, I've wrote a few down, watch the ounces and the pounds will follow. You. You, you, There's you, a flip you, one to that one, by the way. It's the Big Rocks one, right? You should focus on Big Rocks. Yeah, so focus, right, right. It doesn't matter. Come up you, with a you, philosophy. You come to be more like your opponent and they like you. Not all altru altruism is altruistic. There's some self-motivation. And then the, the, my favorite today was your ideas are probably not that stupid. So <laughs> you know, we'll finish up here. Day two from EMC World Live at the Cube. Thanks, everybody, for listening.